Amen. Isn't that singing good this morning? Now, it's not just because I'm up there. He sang one song. Just, there's just one bass up there this morning. He made me sing it. Well, was, no, but it is so good. Again, I want to welcome you to the God's house here today. And, and as the old songs that we sing and everything, thank God I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. And if we have that assurance in our heart, then that's when he'll come and put that little sunshine in. It may be cloudy outside this morning, but Christ Jesus will come and put that little sunshine in our hearts this morning. Like I said, it's so good. And as we come and have the offering this morning, I want all of you to stand while we get ready. And remain standing after the, uh, after the choir comes down, while the choirs come down and everything as we have a fellowship. Let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we can be back in your house this morning. Dear Father, as we've gathered here as, uh, as other brothers and sisters in Christ, we thank you for the drawing of the sweet presence of the Holy Spirit that we felt here this morning. Dear Father, through the Sunday school hour to this hour, Dear Father, we just want to thank you for that sweet presence, that witness that the Holy Spirit gives to each one of us that are saved. Dear Father, we pray this morning that if there's someone that doesn't know you as their Lord and personal Savior, that this will be the hour that they'll come and know you and have that relationship with you, Dear Father, so that they will see that little sunshine that little sunshine that you come and put in our lives as Christians. Dear Father, as we take up the offering this morning, I pray that you will bless it and Dear Father, make it for the uplifting of your kingdom. And now, Father, we always want to give you all the praise and glory, for it's in Christ's name that we do pray for his sake. And amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God.
Gadaria could not be bound with the strongest of chains Jesus went to the cemetery said legion you've been touched and you'll never be the same he's gonna touch me in this hour of trouble and trial when i need him the most devil can't stop him he's gonna touch me by the power of the holy ghost he's gonna touch me now he's gonna touch me now he's gonna touch me yeah in this hour Lord of trouble and trial, when I need him the most, the devil can't stop him, for he's going to touch me by the power of the Holy Ghost. No, the devil can't stop him, for he's going to touch me by the power of the Holy Ghost. Man, thank you, Lonnie. We need that touch, don't we? If you have your Bibles, we're looking at Mark chapter 15. I'd like to invite you to our Sunday school on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock. And we have good teachers, good lessons, and we'd love to have you come and be a part of that. Or on Wednesday night, we have our Awana starts at 6.45. Our teen ministry begins at 6.45 also. And then prayer meeting here in the auditorium. It's basically what we have uh, this morning we have preaching, we have choir singing, we have special singing, uh, but we also have a time where we can share personally our prayer request and come on the altar and pray for each other. It's a wonderful service on Wednesday night. We'd love to have you uh, come and be a part of that. I began a series of messages last week, and I've entitled uh, these messages From the Darkness to the Dawn. I'm talking about uh, from the cross to the empty tomb, and even before the cross, uh, I want to look at... Uh, what took place before the cross. Too often we go straight from Golgotha uh, to the empty tomb. And uh, there were some things that took place before Jesus was nailed to the cross. And I'm going to preach this morning on the six trials of Jesus. What our Lord went through on that night before He went to Calvary. Uh, the things that He suffered. And so if you have your Bibles open to Mark chapter 15, would you stand as we give honor and reverence to the reading of God's Word together. Mark chapter 15 beginning with verse 1, and we'll read down through verse number 15. And straightway in the morning the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered, saying unto him, Thou sayest it. And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold, how many things they witness against thee. Jesus yet answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now at that feast he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired. And there was one uh, named Bar Barabbas, which lay bound with them, that ma had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude, crying aloud, began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will you that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priest had delivered him for envy. But the chief priest moved the people that he should release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said unto them, What will you then that I shall do unto him whom you call 
the king of the Jews, and they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil hath he done? They cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. So that Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. Let's pray together. Father, we ask this morning that you'll use us for your honor, for your glory. Lord, I know that I'm nothing but an instrument. I'm just the messenger, Lord. I hold in my hand the message that you have sent to us. And I pray today, Lord, that we'll take heed. Lord, we'll be reminded of all that you went through so that we could be redeemed, so that we could be saved by your grace. Lord, help us never to take for granted all that happened uh, simply for our sake so that we could be called the children of God. For that, Lord, we'll be grateful and we'll praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Last week, we looked at the surrender of Jesus to the Father's will in the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, the Bible says that he prayed, Father, if thou be willing, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. After Jesus ends his prayer, somewhere probably about one o'clock in the morning, a band of armed men sent by the high priest and accompanied by Judas Iscariot, they come to take Jesus. Now in the darkness of that night, it'd be very easy for Jesus to escape. Uh, he could hear the clamoring of the soldiers. He could uh, see the lights of their lanterns. It'd be very easy for him to make his escape. Uh, but he's come to do his Father's will. And his Father's will is this, is that he go all the way to Calvary's cross and that he pay the sin debt of all the world. We know that Judas betrays our Lord with a kiss. Uh, Jesus is then led away for a long night of trials as he goes to the cross. It's now about 2 o'clock in the morning. By 8 o'clock in the morning, Jesus has undergone six different trials. The first three trials are religious trials. The, third, the second three trials are civil trials. He's going to be tried before the religious leaders for blasphemy. He's going to be tried before Pilate and Herod for treason. All six of these trials are illegal. For instance, a trial was never to be held at night. That was in their Talmud. That was in the uh, Roman law book, is that no trial could be held at night. And then the accused was supposed to have somebody to represent him Yet the Bible teaches us that no one stood with Jesus. The accused could not be declared guilty without uh, witnesses that were very reputable. But we know the Bible says that they brought false witnesses and they couldn't even agree among themselves. Jesus was declared to be guilty, but he was never found guilty. He was never proven to be guilty. The Jews were guided by the uh, Mosaic Law that was interpreted for them in the Talmud. And then the Romans were uh, guided by the Roman Code of uh, civil or uh, criminal procedures. The religious leaders in the Sanhedrin, they knew the law. They spent their lives studying the law. And yet the Bible teaches us that they broke their own law. The Jewish law also stated that a condemned man uh, could not be put to death immediately. They were to wait two days. And during those two days, they were to pray and they were to fast. And they were to seek the will of God concerning a man that was uh, uh, perhaps would be put to death. And then and then only could they come together and vote on capital punishment. I want to take a look, uh, uh, try to take a careful look at these six trials this morning. And, and the first set of trials that we see is the trial before the priest. Mark chapter 14 and verse 53 says, and They led Jesus away to the high priest, and, and with him were assembled all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. Now, John 18 and 13 says that they led him away to Annas first. That brings me to the first trial, the trial before Annas. The high priest at this time is Caiaphas. Caiaphas has succeeded his father-in-law, Annas, and he's the high priest. Yet we read that Jesus was taken to Annas, the former high priest. You see, Annas was the power behind the power. He had great power that he had gained by, uh, by gaining wealth that he ha had obtained in the temple booths by selling uh, by trading in a place that God says was to be holy. And, and Annas despised Jesus. Because you remember in Jesus' life, when he went into the temple and he overthrew the table uh, uh, of these uh, men that were making money illegally, although it's 2 o'clock in the morning, when they get to Annas' house, nothing is said about him being asleep. He's not taken by surprise. This is, uh, they had schemed to do this. 
the religious leaders had met together and they came up with a plan how that they might get rid of the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 18 says this, the high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world, ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whether the Jews always resort, and in secret have I said nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them that heard me. What I have said unto them, behold, they know what I have said. And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil, but if well, why smitest thou me? That's just the beginning of the abuse that Jesus will take that night. One of the soldiers that was standing by literally slapped him in the face. Can you imagine that? Slapping the face of the one that holds your very life in his hand. And yes, that's what happened. After Annas had tried to had tried Jesus, he has him sent to Caiaphas. And that brings us to the trial before Caiaphas. This is the second trial. Caiaphas is the official high priest of that day. The Bible says in verse 24 that Annas had him sent bound into Caiaphas, the high priest. Matthew gives us a different a spin on this, a different take. It's still all the gospel, but it's put, written from a different view. Matthew chapter 26. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. Let me just stop there for a second. Jesus was not talking about Herod's temple. He was not talking about uh, what had been formerly Solomon's temple. Jesus had said to those that were around him, You destroyed this temple. You destroyed this body. And in three days, I'll raise it back up again. And in three days after uh, this event takes place, Jesus did exactly what Jesus said that he would do. He rose from the grave. The Bible says here that the high priest arose and said unto him, Answer thou nothing. What is this which these witnesses against thee? But Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be Christ the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said. Now listen to this. Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man uh, on the, sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of glory. Can I just stop this morning and say that event will take place one of these days. Jesus will come back again. The Bible says, Behold, He cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see Him. The real high priest. I'm talking about Jesus Christ, the only high priest, puts this pretend high priest in His place. By the way, this morning, as we look at Caiaphas' response, the Bible says, Then the high priest were in his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now you have heard his blasphemy. What think you? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. Listen to this. Then they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto thus, thou Christ, who is this that smote thee? Caiaphas wasn't a man of God. He may have had the title, but he wasn't a man of God. He was just simply a puppet of the Roman government. And that, that brings us to the third trial. The trial before the Sanhedrin. Luke chapter 22, verse 66 through verse 71. And as soon as it was day, the elders of the people and the chief priests and the scribes came together and led him into their council or into the Sanhedrin, saying, Art thou the Christ? Tell us. And he said unto them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I also ask you, you will not answer me, nor let me go. Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then said they all, Art thou the Son of God? And he said unto them, Ye say that I am. And they said, What need we any further witness? For we ourselves have heard of his own mouth. Sanhedrin was made up of 70 men, religious leaders of that day. They were governed by the high priests. The Sanhedrin was much like the Supreme Court of America. Of the Supreme Court of that day, like the Supreme Court of our day, had a lot of ungodly men. In America, the Supreme Court has one purpose. That's to interpret the law. But I'm telling you, since the early 60s, they went way above and beyond just interpret the law. They've made the law. It's amazing that in 1776, when our nation came into existence, and the Constitution was then formed, that there was nothing that 
uh, forbid prayer. There was nothing, uh, my friend, that said anything about marriage being between a man and a man or a woman and a woman. There was nothing that said that a baby could be killed in, in its mother's womb and it'd be all right. I'm telling you, the Supreme Court has acted as God's and one of these days they will stand before the God that uh, rules over everything. Every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Israel was under Roman uh, domination and uh, they were allowed to try cases, but they could not pass the death sentence. That belonged to the Roman government alone. Religious leaders, they sentenced Jesus to death, but they didn't have the authority to carry it out. By the way, that just reminds me, religion has no place for Jesus. I'm telling you, the religions of the world do not accept Jesus Christ as Savior. If you saw that video a few days ago of that Jordanian pilot as he was burned to death, you know what they did that in the name of? They did that in the name of religion. Religion doesn't have uh, anything to do with Jesus Christ. I'm not interested this morning in you having religion. I'm interested in you having a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of folks are religious. You realize Jesse James was the son of a Baptist preacher. And it was said that sometimes when he wasn't robbing banks, he'd teach a Sunday school class. Religion won't get you to heaven. Here they are getting rich uh, through the buying and selling that went on in the temple. All you have to do is watch religious television today. They're still doing the same thing. I mean, they're making Jesus an idol of merchandise. Instead of the uh, God that went to the cross of Calvary and bled and died so that we could be saved. Religion today is based on works. Christianity is based on faith. Religion says do. You've got to keep this law and this law and this law. Christianity says done. Jesus cried from the cross. It is finished. Are you dependent on religion this morning? On your good works to save you? I mean giving and praying and good works and baptism and church attendance are all good things. But none of those things have the power to save. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse us from our sins. This morning you have a choice. You can either accept Jesus Christ or you can reject the Lord Jesus Christ. Those three trials, the trial before uh, Annas, the trial before Caiaphas, and then the trial before the Sanhedrin are religious trials. Then we come to the second set of trials. Uh, these are civil trials. The Bible says, first of all, we see the trial before Pilate, Mark 15 and 1, and straightway in the morning. The chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. There's three different trials that I want to look at this morning. There's two trials under Pilate. There's one trial under Herod. Notice, first of all, the first trial before Pilate. Mark 15 and 2, Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered and said unto him, Thou sayest it. Pilate was the Roman governor over Judea. He's at uh, Jerusalem now because it's the feast of the Passover. And he brought, brought about 2,000 soldiers with him to maintain peace in that city. Here he is. Pilate hates the Jews. When you read history about him, when you read Josephus and, and Philio, you read those historians, those Jewish historians, you'll discover Pilate absolutely despised the Jewish people. For a man to become a governor that, Pil that such as Pilate was, he had to go through the ranks. Had to be a brave soldier. He had to be a leader. History tells us that Pilate was a hardened and cruel uh, Roman official. The Jewish historian Philio said this, that uh, King Agrippa wrote a letter to the Roman government describing Pilate. He says this, Pilate is unbending and recklessly hard. He is a man of notorious reputation, severe brutality, prejudice, savage violence, and murder. Because of that report, Pilate is skating on thin ice now. And he's very careful because he knows that if he makes one more blunder, he'll be removed from power. And so that's the setup for the scene that we set before us. That explains why Pilate doesn't throw out the Roman officials when they come to him. If he hadn't been in such trouble with the Roman government, they'd have been out on their head. But Pilate knows that he's got to be careful. 
By the way, Pilate was eventually banished to the Alps and later on committed suicide. Historians tell us that he suffered what we would describe now as a nervous breakdown. Even some say that before he committed suicide, that every Friday that he would go wash his hands, trying to get the blood off of his hands. But he couldn't get the blood off his hands, and neither can we this morning. There's only one thing that will help us, and it's not the washing of sins by water, but it's the washing of our sins through the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want the blood of Jesus off my hands. I want it in my heart. As my old pastor used to sing, his blood is on my soul. Thank God it is. See, the the, the trial before Pilate. The Bible says that Pilate asked Jesus if he was the king of the Jews. And Jesus said, thou sayest it. And you know the word that really bothered Pilate the most was was the word king. Because anybody that was committed uh, to the Roman Empire, they were committed to Caesar as being the only king. And yet here the Bible says here that Pilate asked him if he's the king to declare one, a, oneself as a king was an act of treason against uh, the Romans. When Pilate asked the Jewish leaders what they wanted to do with Jesus, they cry out, crucify him. Notice John's record of this fourth trial in John chapter 18. Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas into the hall of judgment, and it was early. And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled. I will stop there just a moment. They have lied about Jesus. They're about to have Jesus murdered. And yet they're worried that if they put one foot inside the judgment hall, that they'll be defiled. What hypocrisy. What hypocrisy. My friend, the Bible says here that they, that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring you against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him unto thee. Then said Pilate unto them, Take and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spake, signifying what death he should die. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again, and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Pilate, after that he had uh, asked the Jewish leaders, what do you want to do? And they said, crucify him. Pilate meets privately with Jesus. In John chapter 18, verse 37 and verse 38, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am the king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? How amazing. Pilate is looking at face, at truth in the face, and he asks, what is truth? Jesus said in John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is truth. Pilate returns and says to the leaders, I find no fault in him. Boy, he's between a rock and a hard place now. He knows Jesus is innocent. But if he releases him, they will report him to the Roman government saying that he's released a traitor. Then Pilate thinks that he finds him a way out. It's mentioned that Jesus is out of Galilee. Pilate has no jurisdiction over Galilee. Just so happens, though, that Herod, the man that does have jurisdiction, he's also in Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. And so Pilate sends him to Herod. That brings me to the second trial Uh, under the civil trials, the trial before Herod. Luke chapter 23, verse 5 through 7. They were the more fierce, saying, before before Herod, saying, he stirreth up the people throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. Jesus at one time said, go tell Herod that fox, I'm here. We know that a fox is sly, but I don't think that's what he's talking about. A fox under the Levitical uh, system was unclean. You tell that unclean king that I'm here to do my father's will. Herod belonged to a cruel family. He he was known for, uh, that family was known for murdering their own wives and their children. You know, Herod had put away his first wife. In fact, it caused a war. 
And he took his brother's wife. Herodias, it was John the Baptist that stood in Herod's face and said, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. It cost John the Baptist his head, but I'll tell you one thing, he maintained his faith in God. We see this trial before Herod. Luke chapter 23, verse 8 through 11. When Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him. And he'd hoped to see some miracles done by him. Then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And Herod with his men of war set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a purple robe and sent him again to Pilate. Herod is always looking for excitement. You remember the Bible says that Herod one day was having a big party. And I mean, they were boozing it up. They were having a good time. And Herod sends for his stepdaughter, Herodias' daughter Salome, to come and dance before those men. And most Bible scholars believe that really and truly what she was doing, she was dancing before them in the nude. I mean, they were wicked, immoral men. Then Herod got, he gets to the point, he said, you ask whatever you want under the half of my kingdom. Lust will make a man make some foolish decisions. And that's exactly what Herod did. He made a foolish decision. Salome went to her mother, Herodias, and said, What should we ask? And she said, You ask for the head of John the Baptist in a charger. That's the kind of man that Herod was. Had John the Baptist beheaded simply for telling the truth. The Bible says here that Herod, he just wants to be entertained. Show me some miracle. By the way, there's a lot of uh, religions in our world today and some that claim to be Orthodox Christianity that are are so far from it, all they're about is entertainment. I mean, churches are full in this area. Those that all they offer is entertainment. But I want to remind you of something. Entertainment just lasts for a little while and and what you get out of entertainment, it won't be long until you've got to have more and you've got to have more until finally it will not suit you. I don't know about you, but I don't want entertainment. I want the real thing. I don't want something that's counterfeit. I want a real relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus will not be uh, Herod's entertainment. He says not a word. Herod has uh, has a purple robe put on him, sends him back to Pilate. That brings us to the second trial before Pilate. The Bible says in Luke 23, verse 11, he sent him again to Pilate. This time, Pilate thinks that he finally knows how he's going to get Jesus off his hands. The Bible says in Matthew 27, verse 15 through 17, Now at that feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had a notable prisoner named Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will you that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? Pilate thought, surely they won't want to murder. Surely they won't ask me to release Barabbas. I mean, he's been guilty of trying to overthrow the Roman government. He's been guilty of murder. He's a robber. He's a thief. Surely they won't pick a a man that uh, has that kind of reputation over an innocent man. What Herod or what Pilate doesn't realize is this. That crowd that is gathered there has been gathered by the religious leaders. And these people that are there, as you think about them, the Bible says here, when he asked them, uh, what do you want to do with Jesus? They said, let him be crucified. Add to Pilate's dilemma. After that, he'd asked them the second time. And they responded, let him be crucified. Verse 19, when he was sat down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I've suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. The crowd would not give up, and they continued their cry for Jesus to be crucified. Verse 24, when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person, see you to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. When you read that, don't read that too quickly. Take time and think about it. Jesus, the Bible says in Isaiah 
that he was marred more than any man. Even his own mother couldn't recognize him. That Roman lictor, that Roman uh, soldier that had been trying in the art uh, of punishment, of cruelty, took that cat of nine tails and whipped across his back and around his rib cage. 39 stripes, 39 times nine of those strands that ripped the flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ to the point when Jesus looks down and he prophesies in Psalms 22, he says, my bones stare at me. What he was saying is that they have taken away all the flesh. And I look down and I can see my rib cage. The Bible says that he was suffered for us. Oh, dear friend, it's safe to say that there's never been a more unfair, illegal, or shameful set of trials in the history of mankind. That brings me to one more trial. That's the trial of us personally. Every one of us this morning are going to render a verdict on Jesus. Everybody has to. The verdict either is, He'll be my Savior, or I don't want anything to do with Him. You will render a verdict. If you're lost this morning, you'll render a verdict this morning in this service. What will your verdict be concerning Jesus? Your verdict will either be that He's Savior, you'll refuse Him. In the courtroom of your heart, You'll have to make a decision. Unlike verdicts today, I like to watch those shows about uh, how they have trials and how that they use uh, forensic science to uh, figure out who did what. And I was watching one, I guess it was yesterday, a part of one, and and a man went through uh, two hung juries, two mistrials. Let me tell you this morning, there will be no hung juries in your heart. You'll either come down on the one side or the other. Either He is Savior or you don't want to have Him. You reject Him. The verdict will be made by you this morning. The people chose Barabbas over Christ. Choice was between good and evil. I I believe that they were there because they knew Barabbas was about to die. I mean, Barabbas was what they was really looking for in a Messiah. Barabbas tried to overthrow the Roman government. Most people of that day, most Jewish people, they believed that when the Messiah would come, he would overthrow the Roman government. And so to them, Barabbas, the way of the world, was more of a God to them than Jesus was. Barabbas was a popular figure with a common man. He was like a folk hero. They didn't care about Jesus. They didn't believe in Jesus. They they said, release Barabbas, crucify Jesus. It's interesting, the name Barabbas... His full name was Jesus Barabbas. That name simply means Jesus, the son of the fathers. On that day, the crowd had a choice to make. You can either choose Jesus, the son of the fathers, or you can choose Jesus, the son of God. Sadly, they made the wrong decision. Sadly, there'll be thousands that'll sit in a church service, probably some sitting here this morning, that will have to make the decision, what am I going to do with Jesus Christ? Dear friend, the bad news is this. Most people will make the decision, I'm going to reject Him. That's a dangerous thing, by the way, to reject Jesus. The Bible says that He is merciful, that, that, that He's slow to anger. Yet the Bible also teaches there is a deadline. And you can cross it. I'm not going to tell you this morning that you won't have another chance after today to be saved. But I'm telling you this, I wouldn't take a chance on that. Because this may be your last opportunity. This morning is your call to make a decision. If I was you, I'm being honest with you, if I was you, I'd choose Jesus. The verdict of my heart would be, I'm accepting Him. I believe that He is the Son of God. The crowd rejected Jesus because they had no room for Jesus. They had acted in faith. They had went the other way. Uh, Many today are like that crowd that condemned Jesus. I mean, the multitude. You know, the majority is not always right. The majority of the world this morning, 7 billion people is wrong about who Jesus is. That's the reason you have radical Islams this morning. That's the reason that you have uh, all the, the things that are going on in the world. Men have chosen Muhammad over Jesus. 
And I tell you this today, Muhammad is dead. Jesus is alive. The majorities condemned Jesus to death. The majority stood against Jesus. The majority is still against Jesus today. The lost multitude chooses its sin over God's salvation. Chooses hell over heaven. The lost multitude refuses to believe in Jesus Christ. In closing, can I just say, just because the multitudes, the vast majority of people refuse to come to Jesus Christ, does not mean that you have to follow them. They're going off a cliff. I'm talking about a cliff that ends in the pit of hell. Don't you follow them over the cliff. Make up your mind this morning. My verdict is, I'm trusting Jesus Christ. If He's reaching out to you, if He's spoken to your heart, He's calling you, please don't deny Him today. Trust Him. Be saved by His grace. Let your verdict be in favor of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lonnie, come lead us in a song. That's the message. Let's stand today as we sing. If you need to come and talk to the Lord about anything, then the altar is open for you. These people that are standing down here that are here to help you, here to pray with you. Maybe you just need to come in private and, and just spend some time at the feet of Jesus talking to Him about a need. That's all right too. Above anything else that I could say this morning, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, then in the name of common sense, if nothing else, please consider Him today. Please accept Him this morning as we sing. Kneel at the cross, Christ will meet you there. Come while He waits for you. Listen to His voice, leave with Him your care, and begin life anew. Kneel at the cross, leave every care. kept trying to wash the blood of Jesus off his hands he couldn't do it and neither can we you know what it was that nailed Jesus to the cross it wasn't those Roman spikes it was my sins and it was your sins his blood is on us today we're guilty of the death of Jesus Christ there's only one remedy for our guilt that's to come to Him and let Him forgive us and cleanse us from all of our sin. We'll sing another verse of a song. If you're here today, you don't know the Lord. If you're here this morning and maybe you just drifted from God, you're not where you need to be. And I'm going to ask you to step out and come and have a talk with the Father. Maybe you're just carrying a big burden that, that you don't want to carry home with you. You brought it here, but you don't want to leave with it. Why don't you just bring it and lay it down before the Lord and say, Lord, I want you to help me with this. While we sing, kneel at the cross, there is room for all who would his glory share. Bliss there awaits, harm can ever befall those who are anchored there. Kneel at the cross, leave every I would love to invite you back to our services tonight at 6 o'clock and Wednesday night and then next Sunday morning we're going to begin looking at those seven sayings of our Lord from the cross. Uh, today's message has been probably the most difficult message that I've had in this series because there's so much to cover. I mean, so much material to cover. And uh, but Next week we'll just pinpoint some things that our Lord said from the cross 
Those seven sayings, I thirst, it is finished. Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. John, he says, behold thy mother. And his mother, he said, behold thy son concerning John. Just a lot of things that we're going to look at. And it'll bring us to, to Easter Sunday, April the 5th. We're going to look at the greatest event the world has ever known. The resurrection of our Lord from the dead. I hope you'll come and stay with us during this series of messages. Uh, tonight we'll be having Greg Goodman's going to be preaching for us. Uh, Brother Lee's down preaching around Madisonville. And uh, this morning, then tonight, he's going to go to his father's church. While they're in that area, they're just going to stay there today. And he's going to preach at his father's church tonight, where his father goes to church. And uh, he'll be back with us Wednesday, the Lord willing. Uh, but you need to come tonight and hear Greg Goodman. He's a man of God. He'll preach us the gospel. Thank you for being here this morning. God bless you.